Thank you very much. I'm real honored to be invited to speak to you. My name is Renee, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Before I tell you my Holocaust story, I have to tell you a little bit of the history of where I was born. I was born in a country that doesn't exist anymore in Europe called Czechoslovakia. I wonder how many of you know about Czechoslovakia. Great. I, uh, I want to let you know that before World War I, uh, Europe, Middle Europe, was one country. It was called the Austro-Hungarian Monarchy. By the way, I also apologize for my voice. I'm just recovering <laughs> from an infection. Um, <clears throat> it was called the Austro-Hungarian Monarchy, which tells you that Austria and Hungary were the two major uh, ruling countries. And, uh, and uh, there were two Czech professors in Chicago at the university teaching. One was called Thomas Masaryk, and the other one was Edward Benesch. Now, I'm really curious, how many of you heard that name? One person. I'm so amazed because they both were very well-known politicians. And uh, when they found out that uh, after World War I that Europe is changing, that the borders are changing, each country that spoke a different language wanted their own borders, and the borders were changing in Europe, they decided they want to have their own country also, a Czech country. And um, they, uh, Masaryk already had an American wife, of course, and they decided to approach the American government to help them. And with the help of the American government, they went back and created Czechoslovakia. So I, I always feel that the Americans should know this. <laughs> anyway, um, the only problem was that all the other countries already had their borders. So the only piece of land that was still available was in the very heart of Europe. If you look at a map of Europe, you'll see that Czechoslovakia is bordering with Germany and then goes through. It's a long strip of land that's in the very middle of Europe. So it's bordering with every country in Europe. And it's, it winds up at the other end with bordering with the Soviet Union, with the Russians. So you can imagine a country that has to deal with all these countries, with Germany, with Poland, with Hungary, with Romania, all these countries. So it was a very unique country, and I was very, I'm very proud to be born there. Now, I was born on the very western corner by the way, Czechoslovakia had three regions. It was the Czech reg region, which was Bohemia. In the middle, it was Slovakia. And then at the very end was the Carpathian. And uh, uh, each one had different bordering with different countries. The Czech Republic, for example, bordered with Germany and with uh, Austria. Uh, Slovakia was bordering with Poland and with Austria and with Hungary. And our region was bordering also with Poland, with Hungary, and touched the Russians, touched uh, Russia. So uh, each country had a little bit different language also because of the relations to the other countries was very unique, needless to say. In 1921, uh, we began to hear about a man in Germany whose name was Adolf Hitler. Nobody knew who he was, where he came from, but they are finding out that he hates Jewish people and he's organizing some kind of an anti-Jewish group which is called the Nazi Party. 
where the Nazi party, we of course are not worried because Czechoslovakia is a democracy. Nothing like that can happen in our country. But still curious, what, what does this man want? Well, what is even worse, by 1923, this man is elected chancellor of Germany. Still nobody knows. Where did he come from? Who is he? What is he going to do? And now he was uh, creating a huge army. And he was creating these shows. When you went to the movie theaters, you could see uh, pre uh, before the film was shown, they were showing these, uh, uh, I don't even know what they were called, but they were showing his army and he, he, his show with, with his German army. And of course, all of Europe was now beginning to worry. What does he need an army for? World War I just ended. Uh, is he going to fight again? Who is he going to fight and why? Well, Mr. Chamberlain of England decided that he will find out. He organized a lone meeting with Mussolini from Italy, Mr. Daladier from France, and uh, Hitler, and uh, they were questioning him. What, what does he need the army for, and why, why is he doing all this? Hitler's answer was that part of Czechoslovakia, which was bordering uh, with Germany, which is called the Czech Republic, uh, used to, the borders of that Czech Republic used to belong to Germany. It is a territory called the Sudetenland. And he feels that Sudetenland should be returned to Germany. Now, uh, England and France in 1938 made the biggest mistake of, uh, of the European history because that created the Holocaust and World War II. So England allows Hitler to march into the Sudetenland. And of course, that's not what Hitler wanted. He wanted to be, have, have a step, a foot into Czechoslovakia. And a few months later, his army marched into the capital, which was the city of Prague, and wiped Czechos Czech Republic off the map. Now, that's all right. But what is he going to do with Slovakia? He didn't have the right for Slovakia or for the Carpathian. So he decides that Slovakia should just become a separate country. Gave, he, he got autonomy put in a, Ger a Nazi government, and everything is going to be fine in Slovakia. He didn't realize that Slovakia became his worst enemy. It was the only country during the war where they were training partisans and freedom fighters. <laughs> anyway, now still is the Carpathian. What to do with this little tail, the little corner uh, of um, Czechoslovakia? Well. Hitler, by the way, who was not even German, Hitler was an Austrian, and he, was, he had a relationship with Hungary through the Austro-Hungarian uh, creation. Uh, he decided that maybe Hungary should occupy that little tail, and sure enough, the Hungarians marched in, and uh, overnight, in 1939, we became Hungarians. Now, uh, my father had a beautiful home in the city of Ushorod, which was the capital of this region. And uh, he had a very good business. I had a brother who was five years older than me and a little sister who was four and a half years younger than myself. And overnight, we became Hungarians, not knowing that Hungary already had similar anti-Jewish laws that Germany had. Not really like Germany, but very similar. So as soon as the Hungarians marched in, my father's business was confiscated. We had to turn in all our valuables, whatever that meant. And uh, Jewish children could no longer go to public schools. So it was 
a little bit difficult, needless to say, but we figured there is a war going on somewhere, so maybe that's why this is happening. Well, we realized that by now, uh, Holland, Belgium, Greece was occupied by the Germans. So we just never even imagined that, that this is going to, something like that will happen to us, of course. Now it's 1938, and uh, we are still in our homes. That was the only difference the Hungarian government had from all the other anti-Jewish governments, that they allowed the Jews remain in their homes. But, uh, of course, we had no idea what, what comes next. Uh, this was uh, going on. Uh, for a while, and then Hitler decided that now he is strong enough, and uh, maybe he can accomplish what he really wanted to accomplish, and that uh, to uh, conquer all of Europe, including the Soviet Union. So to get to the Soviet Union, or to invade the Soviet Union, he has to go through Poland. So he invades Poland. And Poland is not ready for a war. They can defend themselves, and Hitler occupies Poland. And now we hear rumors that in Poland, he's shooting children and Jews into mass graves. And we in Hungary say, that couldn't be. I mean, what people can do such thing? I mean, it's impossible. But the rumors are coming, and the facts are being proven, and sure enough, this is going on in Poland. And he runs through Poland, and now he's on the Russian border, and he's going to invade the Russians. We are laughing. He's going to invade the Russians. The Russians are going to swallow him. That's not what happens. He invades the Russians, and he's marching into Russia. The Russians are not protecting themselves. They are not defending themselves. So now we are really worried. Now Hitler is going to have what he wants, and we are for sure doomed. What we didn't know, that when Napoleon invaded the Soviet Union, the Russians, the Russians, uh, he was also very successful up till the time he reached White Russia, almost at Stalingrad. And when he reached that territory, winter set in, and he didn't realize what the Russian winters are. So he lost the war, actually, because of the winter. And now the Russians are pushing him, push, and Hitler does the same thing. The Russians actually lured the German army into that same territory, which we didn't know, so we were surprised that the Germans just walking into, you know, Russia. When they reached the territory, sure enough, at winter time, the same thing happens. And now the Russians are pushing Hitler out of the Soviet Union, and they discover that in Russia, he also was shooting Jews and children into mass graves. They are finding these graves. What they found out also, that Hitler also shot Russian Soviet officers he captured into those same graves. And so you can imagine the Russians are now really pushing and pushing Hitler out of wherever, wherever they can catch him. Now Hitler's army reaches already the Ukraine. I don't know whether you know that in the Ukraine there is a grave called Babi Yar. Anybody knows about Babi Yar? In Babi Yar, they shot 26,000 Jews into a mass grave and 1,800 Soviets. And so Hitler's army is there. Hitler wants them to actually eliminate, get rid of this grave so that it's not found by the Russians. But the Russians are pushing and Hitler has to go back to Germany. Now, to go, his army to go back to Germany, he has to cross the Hungarian border. And now we are shaking, of course. 
uh, what's going to happen to us. And sure enough, Hitler's army reaches our borders and finds, Hitler finds out that the Hungarian president, who was his closest friend and ally, is double-crossing him. Hungary now is the only country where the Jews are still living in their homes. In all the European countries, the Jews were already in some kind of camps. And uh, of course, they were called ghettos, uh, not camps yet. And uh, uh, so, so um, I'm trying to remember where I was. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Hitler's army, oh, no, the, the Jews, the, the, the Hungarian Jews, they are the only ones that still live in their own homes. And uh, so, uh, of course, Hitler's army marching, marches in, and next morning, in our homes, uh, in, the, in our villages, in our towns, there are posters uh, plastered saying that the Hungarian Jews are in good physical condition. No other Jews are like that. And therefore, they will be taken to Germany to help out the German army. The German army, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to uh, probably, I'm sorry. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. Well, we are going to harvest producing food for the German, German army, or we are going to work in factories producing for war machinery. We can take a suitcase with us, but they tell us the measurement of the suitcase, how big the suitcase can be. <coughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. So we can take this little suitcase with us. They tell us the measurements and how much it can weigh. So you can imagine they wanted everybody to carry their little suitcase, even the children. They walk us to the railroad station. And of course, we are looking for passenger trains. There are no passenger trains on the tracks. Cattle cars are waiting. And they tell us to pack into these cattle cars. And the Jewish people amongst themselves, of course, are talking. We are going to help them out. At least they can take us in a regular, on a regular train. <coughs> no, uh, we pack into these cattle cars. The cattle car I was in, there was about 120 of us. Uh, of course, there was no room to sit down. So I am now three days after my 20th birthday. And uh, it is 1944. And uh, I have a few colleagues in the cattle car. So we decide to help out the old people so at least they can sit down and take children out of the arms of 
parents, to place them into the laps of these elderly, to make it a little more comfortable for us. Now people are talking to each other. How long do you think this trip will go on? And people say, well, from Hungary to Germany, takes maybe six, seven hours, train ride, we'll manage. They didn't give us any food, but no water either. And they lock the cattle cars, of course, from the outside, and the train moves, and now we're traveling. We're traveling six, seven hours, nine hours, 12 hours, we are still traveling. Now the people are getting worried, begin to talk to each other. But where do you think we're going? I mean, we should have been there a long time ago. Nobody seems to know, of course. Night time comes, the train stops. Finally, we arrive to our destination. Not so. Now they are not opening the cattle cars. The Nazi soldiers who are escorting our train are banging on the walls of the cattle cars, yelling to us, if we are hiding any money or any valuables, any jewelry, gold, we should money, we should give it up, or we're gonna suffer very serious consequences. Well, people are looking at each other, what should we give up? They took everything away from us when we packed into the cars, so nobody has anything. Well, what we didn't know, that we were not in the same country, we were in another country, where the uh, Jews were packed into cattle cars who were attached to our train. And they were asking them to give up everything, just they, uh, the way they took everything from us. We traveled three and a half days, not knowing where we are, not having any food, any, any water, which was more important, <coughs> really, than the food. And uh, on the fourth day, the train finally stops, and we hear latches being opened, so finally we are somewhere, the Nazis are screaming, and uh, so apparently we arrive where we are supposed to be. The cattle car opens, I grab my little sister's hand, and I said to her, we don't know where we are, we don't know what's going on out there. I'm just telling you that whatever you see or hear, you have to ignore and just hold, keep holding on to me. And she starts crying, but let's go with mother and dad. Mother and dad disappeared. The minute you jumped out of the cattle car, millions of people are standing already there. My parents disappeared in the crowd. So now I'm re reassuring my sister not to worry, when we get in, wherever they are going to take us, we will be reunited with them, not to worry. We are getting out of the cattle cars. I'm trying to realize or figure out where we are, what's going on here. Now I see that the Nazis are separating the crowd. And what, what are they doing? Well, in one place they put all the old men and the other place, there are all the old women. And then the young women and the young men separate. And the children in a separate group. I have no idea where we are. I have no idea what's going on here. So I'm trying to imagine in my head, what, what does that mean? And I figured, well, maybe they are separating us because we, the young people, will be working, but the old women will probably take care of the children, and the old men will be working in the camp. And, and of course, the young people will do what they told us we're gonna do. Well, they take us, first we keep staying in the, uh, at the railroad station overnight, and while we are all st still standing there, wondering where are we gonna sleep, where they are gonna take us, all of a sudden, out of the four corners of the camp where there was a brick chimney, fire, smoke starts shooting to the sky, 
everybody screaming, what is the fire? The sky becomes red. We have no idea what that fire is. We think maybe, are they going to kill us here with the fire? What is, where are we? What, what's happening? Now, people are beginning to worry. It doesn't look as good as it looked in, uh, during the day when we got off. And nobody seems to know what's going on. And now daybreak comes, and all of a sudden, some women with uh, clubs, like baseball bats, come over and start beating us and start yelling to us, yelling to us. And somebody says, these are the capos. Well, what is a capo? We have no idea what is a capo. And uh, they start beating us. The fire is still blowing. What do they want from us now? Well, they are pushing us into long lines of columns of five. What's going to happen now? This takes almost a half a day before we all are lined up. And I don't even realize what's going on because I'm worrying about my sister. She shouldn't get hurt because they are beating and pushing. Some people are lying already, not able to get up. So all of a sudden, it's late afternoon. I keep looking around. What actually is going on here? And I realized that we were lined up in these columns of five, long, long lines of thousands of people. So I'm figuring, why did, why did they do this? What do they want from us now? And as I'm looking around, my prisoner next to me turns to me and she says, do you know why they lined us up here? I said, no. Why, do you? She says, of course. Now they are going to bring the machine guns, and they are going to wipe us out. And I think to, think to myself, if that is true, then why am I afraid to ask these couples whatever I want to know? And I tell my little sister not to move, and I step out of the line and walk over to one of these couples, and very politely, I ask her, does she know when we're going to be reunited with our parents? And she looks at me like I'm crazy, points to one of the chimneys, and yells at me, you don't see the chimney and the fire? There go your parents. There go my parents? What does that mean? How could anybody imagine what was going on? That our parents were immediately killed and, and burned, and that was the fire. Our parents were burning. And I come back to my sister. As I turn around, the capo yells back at me, don't worry, when you go through the chimney, you will be reunited. I go through the chimney. I still have no idea what she's talking about. It took us a little while before we found out where we are, what's going on. We, we thought, of course, that we are in Poland, that we, were, uh, that we are in Germany. But we were not. We were in Poland. We were in Poland in a camp called Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was really the only extermination camp. I don't even know how many millions were killed here. And uh, my parents were gone. Later I found out that my father is alive in a work camp in Auschwitz. And my little sister stayed with me for six months. And then one day, well, every day, by the way, we lined up for roll call twice. In the morning, at 4 o'clock in the morning, the whistle blew. We had to run out. We had to line up for roll call. And roll call usually ended by 9 o'clock. Uh, after roll call, after 
the couples counted us, and all of a sudden, a Nazi officer by the name Dr. Mengele showed up and uh, passed by the lineup, and with his finger, he pointed at some people, and those had to go out and follow him. And of course, later we found out that those were immediately uh, killed. And uh, we were being fed. And the morning feeding was that in the column of five, the first prisoner received a little bowl of liquid, which was called ersatz. Well, nobody seemed to know what ersatz was. It resembled coffee or tea, but this bowl of liquid had to be shared with the five of us in the column. Now, you know, when it bowl reached the third prisoner, it usually was empty. Everybody was starving. So then you, next morning, you had to fight your way into the lineup so you can, get, you can be the first one or second one to get the ball. Anyway, uh, unbelievable uh, situations. Then in the afternoon, by the way, we were not, not allowed into the barrack during the day. Winter, summer. The summers were like in California, 100 and some degrees heat. At winter time, snow, frost, nothing. In that one dra I forgot to tell you one very important thing. When, when they took us away from the railroad station, they took us underground into a bathhouse. And uh, we, we went into a dressing room where they told us to get undressed. And when we got undressed, they opened another door into a shower room. And the showers were running from both sides. So people went into under the shower to take a shower. They told us we should fold our belongings very neatly. We should remember exactly where it is because when we come out of the shower, we will have to dress quickly. Well, uh, we went into the shower hoping to take a shower. We were not permitted to take a shower. We were just allowed to run through, naked, through these showers and wound up on the other side in a little clearing where some Nazi soldiers with the vicious dogs, which were previously uh, teased on people getting out of the train, uh, were waiting for us. And we were standing there while these dogs were barking and growling and biting. And we were screaming, crying, not no, naked, wet, not knowing what the hell is happening to us. In the middle of the night, a Nazi officer shows up and takes about a thousand of us out of here, takes us back up, and puts us into a wooden barrack. Now we see, which we didn't even notice or realize before, that we were in some kind of a place where they had rows and rows of wooden barracks as far as, as the eye could see, and each row of barracks was divided with a row of barbed wires. And we thought it was some kind of a German village, that that's the way the Germans are building the villages. And then we find out that, of course, uh, we are in, a, in this camp, they take us into one of these uh, barracks, and we are a thousand women standing in line, wondering what's going on in the front. We are wet, naked, hoping that maybe some food is waiting for us, or at least some water. This is three days without any food or water. Uh, or maybe they are giving us, uh, us some clothes. When we come closer, we realize that's not what's happening at all. They are shaving the women's heads and bodies. By the time we reach there, we can't recognize any of these people. And now I'm worried that when they do this to us, 
I won't be able to recognize my sister. So I'm holding on to her, whatever, as uh, watching her like a hog, so that we don't get separated. So now there is a big pile of old clothes, and after they shaved us, they tell us we can pick a dress and put it on our naked bodies, and that's how they take us back into the camp. And now, uh, as I said, we slept on these three-story bunks at four o'clock in the morning, every morning, the whistle blew and we had to come out for roll call. And then, all day long, we were not permitted to enter the, bar the, uh, the barrack. So we had to stay out, whether it was winter, snowing, uh, uh, freezing, in this one dress that we were wearing. Um, some of us had shoes, some of, them d some of us didn't. <coughs> so they gave us some Dutch wooden clogs. And uh, all day long, we had to stay outdoors. We were not allowed to get into the bar barracks because they were scrubbing the bunks. So when we got into the bunks, they were always w sort of wet. Uh, so um, at 3 o'clock in the, in the afternoon was the second roll call. Again, we lined up. And after roll call, which ended at 9 o'clock at night, uh, they were feeding us again. This time, we received a slice of bread. And then we had to put our hands out like this and they splashed a spoonful of sugar beets in our hands, which of course was a lifesaver for us, the sweet sugar, we needed it terribly. Anyway, this was our daily food, and this was our daily treatment. At nine o'clock again at night, we were permitted to go into the barracks, into our bunks, lights out, and four o'clock in the morning it started again. That was our daily routine. And uh, six months after we arrived there, my sister was taken away from me. I had no idea where. Of course, I thought that she was probably killed. But 37 years later, uh, Steven Spielberg was making a movie called The Last Days. And they took me back to Auschwitz because they wanted to film me in, in Auschwitz. And I went into the archives. Actually, they wanted me to go into the archives so I can see if I can find any document proving that I was there. And I sure enough found my document, but I also found my sister's document. And on her document was a stamp which said Hygienic Institute. I had no idea what Hygienic Institute was. But uh, next to it was a signature of a Dr. Munch. So I went over to the archivist asking, what does all this mean? He says, I really don't know, he says, but I have the address of this Dr. Munch. I'll give you his address, and you can write to him, and maybe he will tell you what this all is about. While I'm talking to the archivist, the filmmaker who's filming all this comes over to me and whispers to me, you don't need Dr. Munch's address. We are going tomorrow morning to interview Dr. Munch, so you're going to come with us, and you can talk to him. Well, this is a miracle. Sure enough, next morning we fly to Munich and they go in to set up for his interview. And while they are in, the filmmaker goes over to Dr. Munch and Mrs. Munch and says that there is a survivor on the truck out there. So I, I'm wondering, would you mind if she came in, came in to show you she has a document from your clinic and she would like you to explain what this document means. 
and Mrs. Munch says, a survivor, a Holocaust survivor? No, you cannot bring her in here. I won't let her come in. So they come out and they tell me not to worry. They will take the paper in after they did the interview and they will, he will explain it to them and they will explain it to me. So uh, fine, I'm sitting on the truck for nine hours waiting for the interview to end. And sure enough, after the interview is over, the filmmaker goes over to Dr. Munch again and says, Doctor, this woman is sitting out there all these hours. All she wants is to show you this document that comes from your clinic to explain it to her. So he says, OK, bring her in, but tell her if she's going to be provocative, if she's going to ask me questions I don't want to answer, I'm just not going to answer to her. So they come out and they warn me to be very careful not to upset the doctor. Don't ask such questions which would upset him. And fine with me. All I want is to, you know, tell me what's this document. I walk in and Dr. Minch is standing at the door. And when I come close to the door, he reaches for my hand. And I think to myself, is this Nazi really tricking me that I should keep his hand and then he's going to kill me or whatever he's going to do to me? A Nazi doesn't shake hands with a Jew, that's for sure. So I don't know what to do. But he's standing there with his hand out. So when I come close, I take his hand. And while I'm holding his hand, I look up above him on the wall. And there is his picture in the Nazi uniform, Dr. Munch. And who is next to him? Hitler's picture. 37 years after the Holocaust, Hitler's picture in, is in his, on his wall in his living room. At that point, something happens to me. And I know I'm going to watch, control what I'm going to ask. What I'm going to say, never. If he kicks me out, <laughs> he'll kick me out. I don't care. So I walk in with him in the room. They are still filming, of course. He's sitting on a little bench. He sits down and points next to him to, for me to sit. That's another thing. Sitting next to a Nazi, OK. So I sit down, and now I can't wait. I don't know how to upset this man, but something I have to do to really get him. I turned to him, and very politely, I said, doctor, uh, uh, they tell me that you were the head doctor at the Hygienic Institute in Auschwitz. And uh, they told me also that you were all day long, you were experimenting on Jewish women and children, Jewish children. Um, so he, he thinks for a little while. And I said, well, doctor, how was it? You know, m my father used to come home for lunch or dinner. And at the dinner table, we were always working about his work. Did you tell your wife and your children what you were doing all day long? Or, doctor, when you were putting the children to bed, did you tell them bedtime stories about your work? And he yells at me, I never told bedtime stories to my children. I had an aunt who used to tell me bedtime stories, and I used to have nightmares. But first I asked him, you know, after you experimented on all these women, doctor, how could you come home and make love to your wife? Now he jumps up. He's really angry. I see. He's angry, and he's turning to leave. So I grab this paper that I brought from the clinic and push it in front of him, hoping 
that his curiosity is going to take it from me. Sure enough, he takes the paper, he looks at it, and he says, smiles, he says, oh, that's my clinic, and sits back down. I said, yes, doctor, that's your clinic, and there were names on this paper. I point to my sister's name, and I said, and doctor, this was my sister. I was wondering, what kind of experiments did you perform on her? He looks at me angrily again. We did only harmless experiments. Well, doctor, if they were harmless experiments, why did she die? And now he really angry. He says, she didn't die in the experiments, but we couldn't send them back to tell everybody what we were doing. We had to get rid of them, so we shot them. 37 years later, I find out that my 14-year-old sister was shot for, of course, no reason. And, uh, you know, the stories are still going on. And here we are. I was hoping that by now, the world really learned a lesson. I was hoping that people were changing, that people were getting to know each other, that people are trying to help each other. But the world is in the worst shape than it was then. People are still being murdered. Children are still being shot into graves. So even though I'm 94 years old, can I stop telling my story? Can I stop telling what human beings can do to one another? To one another? I, as long as I'm alive and as long as I can walk and talk, I will tell my story. Well, I thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to present you this Firestone oh. with a token of our appreciation for coming here. It's from the District Attorney County of Santa Clara. It says, in recognition of your courage and determination, Renee Firestone, Thank you for sharing your inspirational story of survival. We will never forget April 23rd, 2018, Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. Thank oh, my God. You.